when you have weight gain, right, you have more, more fat cells, they're bigger, they produce more leptin, right? And that should tell your body, hey, I'm, I have a lot of energy reserves, so you decrease food intake, so your appetite should lower, and you increase energy expenditure. Your metabolism goes up when you have more fat cells, right? That's true for a normal, healthy, functioning human being, right? So what happens when somebody's obese? What happens to these three particular proteins? What, 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 do, you think, what do you guys think happens? All right, so if you're, hmm? all right, you have increased insulin. What else? Hmm. Mm hmm Yep, yep. Any other thoughts? So those are both correct, all right? Your insulin levels go up. Your, oh, sorry. Your insulin levels go up. Your leptin levels go up your ghrelin levels go down, right? So that's what you would expect for n natural response to getting, having more fat cells, right? And having bigger fat cells. All these things should happen. Well, the problem when, when you have obesity is, is, the, is the resistance of insul to insulin and leptin. It takes more and more of those signals to get the same response as you get, as you get uh, heavier as a person. So it's this vicious cycle where for both insulin and leptin, you eat food, Right, but it takes, and you make your leptin or insulin, but it takes more and more of that leptin and insulin to achieve the same signal in, um, in, a, in an obese person. So like basically, your receptors become less sensitive. Your receptors become less sensitive, you start, you don't really get that kind of benefit of I'm full. It actually, that signal does not reach your brain. So you, you think your, your body thinks you're actually thin and wants to, make you eat more. There's a vicious cycle. And so you think about it, insulin resistance, right? This is, the, this is kind of the, the cycle that leads to adult onset diabetes, right? Yes, just this stuff. Well, so th that's the problem, right? Like you could over prescribe that, but again, you're still building up the receptor's tolerance for insulin and leptin. It's effective, it, it, it's not effective long term, right? Because you're still not addressing the fundamental problem that the receptors themselves are less, are less uh, able to respond. Right? So this is how, this is why it's actually really hard for um, once you become obese to actually lose the weight because you still have these unreceptive receptors who are responding to less and less of the signal. So, but, then this begs the question again, how do people become fat in the first place? What's the trigger for that? Well, that's more of your hedonistic eating system, all right? So this is a system that's kind of related. Um, it's actually the same, the same kind of molecular controls of people, um, and they've shown this in mice, compared to uh, drug addiction. All right, so they have these mice, and they provide them access to unlimited amounts of these things. Food, drugs, food, cocaine, or heroin. And the responses are the same. The longer they have access to these unlimited quantities of this, the more and more of those things are required to get the same response or the same reward thresholds. Right? So you have these, these, these uh, two reactions to a, a piece of food. You have, your eat it, you have your homeostatic level where if you're hungry, you should eat. But if you're not hungry, oh, I probably shouldn't eat that piece of cake. I'm full. Right? That's your... Um, insulin, ghrelin, leptin responses. But you also have this other uh, uh, response, the hedonistic system. It's saying, ooh, cake, I want to eat more of that. Or ooh, cookies, or ooh, something really pleasurable to my mind, right? So it's, oh, that's going to override your homeostatic signal saying, I'm full, I probably shouldn't eat anything. It's like, oh, I really want to eat this because it's really tasty, right? And what it is is really your dopamine receptors, okay? So they've done the studies. Cocaine is effective because it blocks your dopamine transporters from being taken back up to your, uh, um, taken back up to uh, by the precursor axon. So that's why you have you're flooding your your uh, uh, in between nerve area with more dopamine, and that's what causes the response, special response to cocaine. Right. Well, food's a similar way. You're not blocking anything. 
you're just, every time you eat this pleasurable food, you're releasing more dopamine. And your body, your neurons love that. Right? So it's a, it's a similar response. So that's your, your hedonistic system of reward in your brain can override your body's ability to just say, hey, I'm full. Yes, my It's it's um it's the same thing. Anything that gives you pleasure is going to basically go down this dopamine pathway. So it could be drugs, it could be food. Um, gamblers have the same thing. So if you have an addictive personality, you'll also tend to tend to use this dopamine reward system in your brain. So it's your it's your brain's dopamine system overriding all your other homeostatic controls. I think that's more of evolutionary. The reasons why we don't know, but we do know that this has happened. And actually, they've actually done correlative studies which show that um, people who have more addictive personalities also tend to um, gain weight more easily. So you could, you know, that's same with gambling, same with drugs, same, same mechanisms exist with food. Okay. Um, yeah, sure. All right, real, real quick, one question. You don't think so? All right. We'll skip this question for now. I know we're going a little. We're about halfway through, and we have more of the class. All right. So, treatments. Uh, what are things you can do? Well, diet and exercise is obviously most con most easiest, uh, least invasive way to actually uh, solve the obesity problem, right? Here's the problem with that. Um, most people are really bad about their diet and exercise. All right, so like there's, here's, the, here's our goals for all these healthy things. We should be eating more of these as a population, and we don't do that. Here's the things we try to limit. Meat, poultry, eggs, uh, calories from solid fats and sugars. We don't do that. We're very bad at that as a society. Um, we're also very bad about exercise. So this is the Gallup poll. How often do you exercise, generally speaking? Um, so half the population does exercise more than three days per week. Half the population does not. And this is actually even reflected in, in health measures uh, in, in versus, if you break this down by weight, right, BMIs. Overweight people tend to not exercise compared to normal weight and even um, uh, people. Right? So we know the right things to do, change your diet, exercise more. We're just really bad at it. And in fact, here's an interesting study. This is the natural, uh, National Weight Control Registry. This is an American uh, study where they basically ask people who want to lose weight to voluntarily sign up for this study. So these are people who are actively self-selecting to lose weight. They want to lose weight. And their goal is to get about 7 to 10% weight loss in the initial year and may keep that off for greater than, year, greater than a year. So greater than 5% weight loss maintained for at least one year. Look at the numbers here. I don't know if you can see this. Can you see this? Okay. 20% managed to get, hit that first year goal. Thank you. Yeah, that was wonderful. Oh, okay. 20% managed to hit that first year goal. Half that, half of that population doesn't look, keep that weight off. However, once you get past uh, two to five years, once you get past five years, your odds of maintaining that weight loss are really great. So if you can get past like the first two years of weight loss, your odds of keeping that weight off are actually fairly good. But think about that. You have a single, single digit percentage of people who actually want to lose weight actually manage to do it. Right? And this is because it's about a lot, it, you actually have to change your lifestyle. It's actually really hard. Right? If you try to do dieting, you have this problem where you diet, your body basically has a famine response, right? Because you're not getting the food, so it's going to starve. It's going to want you to overeat. You, as soon as you fall off, you overeat and you gain all that weight back. It's this horrible cycle. Right? So what about something like pharmacological therapy? OK. Drugs are interesting because think about it. You're, you're affecting your neurological system, your endocrine system, or gastrointestinal system. So there are drugs that can try to cure obesity, but they have horrible side effects in general. And they aren't things that most people want to try. All right? For example, this one has psychosis and addictions, right? and you can die. This one has increased heart attack. So think about it. I'd rather be obese, rather have risk of death because of these drugs. So most people, uh, drugs tend not to be 
um, the way to go because they tend to have global effects on your system. Yes, Shmi. It's a it's a blocker of your. I think it affects your dopamine levels in some way. Right. The problem is also it has horrible other side effects. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So. Yeah. So there's other drugs under investigation, but. The problem of, with drugs right now is that they have a lot of side effects, all right? Now, this one I'll talk about in the next one. This is actually a one directly affecting fat absorption in your, in your GI. And this is one that's actually um, manufactured and been on the market for a while. And it's the use for um, long-term weight loss. And what it does is really inhibits the lipases that are secreted from your pancreas from actually digesting your fat into some things that are absorbable by your microvilli. So actually, in, reduce the amount of fat absorbable by your by your body when you eat. And they've done these uh, again these trials where if you take olestat, you actually lose weight and keep it off much better than if you take a placebo or if you take olestat and a placebo afterwards. Right. So this is a drug that you can use to uh, lose weight because it directly affects your gastrointestinal tract and it has, it has less side effects than something that's affecting your endocrine system or your nervous system. Right. All right. Leptin therapy, though. So this is, uh, as that thought, hey, maybe we can do re leptin that will, you know, uh, cure the obesity. It was tried in the 90s, and it just didn't seem to have an effect. Again, the receptors are the problem, not the actual leptin itself, right? However, they just have recently approved it for people who have the leptin-producing defect, right? If you have this genetic defect, which is very rare, um, that you can't produce leptin, you will tend to overeat like that fat, like that fat mo uh, mouse did, right? So. If you can supplement those people with leptin, you actually cure that problem. Again, it does have risks, but it's, it, it's uh, when you, every time you, uh, whenever you talk about drugs, it's all about weighing the risks versus the rewards of the, of the therapy. Okay. OK, moving on. What about surgical interventions, bariatric surgery? Right? The concept is obviously you want to limit the amount of food, and you also want to uh, reduce the amount of absorption. That the, of, of the food that you did process into your body. Now, this is actually um, a fairly risky thing because you can, there's a lot of side effects. You could die from the surgery, so it's not it's a very drastic measure. So there's NIH guidelines about bariatric surgery. And these are the guidelines that they tell uh, doctors when they advise patients for going, undergoing this. All right? Pretty severe things, right? You have to have a BMI of over 40 that's morbidly obese. Right? Or you can have a, a severely obese with one or more associated health problems, things like diabetes, high blood pressure, hypertension. Right? And they tell you to do this if everything else fails. Right? So you have to try other things first. Yes, Shmi. Hmm? No, no, no. The, so that's a liposuction. That's different. This is a surgery that actually re physically reduces the space of your stomach. OK, so uh, I'll go into detail about the, what the different types of bariatric surgery are in a second. So bariatric surgery is something that's increasing. Um, it's really jumped for a, a lot in the last decade. People are using it more and more. And there are really four general types of bariatric surgery. So this is where you, know, you, you basically cut a portion of your stomach and reroute your, uh, your intestines. So this is called the ruin Y. It's the gold standard. What you do is basically you staple your stomach. Right, so partially stomach, stomach, can make a smaller pouch so that you will limit the food intake. And then you take the upper portion of your intestine and cut that out and attach that to the stomach. Right, so what you're doing is, like, again, limiting the size of your stomach. And if you take out this portion, upper portion of your intestine, that's where a lot of your nutrient absorption is happening. So you're reducing nutrient absorption. Right? You also have, this is a traditional stomach staple. You're actually just cutting off part of your stomach, right, limiting that. There's the gastric band where you just attach a band and this is going to actually restrict your amount of food that can go into your stomach. Right? This is probably the least invasive. This is the most invasive. You not only do this, right, but then you take the majority of your intestine and bypass that. So you're actually really reducing malabsorption. Okay? And so obviously there's op op uh, various options if you want to go this route. Uh, you can have minimally invasive or open surgeries. You could have laparoscopic ones, which are kind of done here, or something done robotically. 
A lot of risk involved, though. Okay, so but it's fairly effective, though. Okay, look at the weight loss for one year, three year follow-up. And this isn't kilograms, mind you. So it's actually a lot. As you can see, forty some here, gastrointestinal, gastric band, adrenal switch has the most, but also has the most side effects. Side effects include things like surgical complications, nutritional deficiencies, and possibility of death. So this is not to be taken lightly. Okay, and the reason why. Uh, Ruin Y is considered the gold standard. It's the best compromise of weight loss versus post-operative effects. That's why, and more and more people are using it. And these techniques are are being used less and less. Now you will see a do on a switch occasionally for somebody who's severely obese, but that's a very extreme condition, uh, very extreme surgery. Bariatric surgery is also really good for resolving um, problems in a person, other health problems. Right, so if you have a bariatric surgery, you can really um, solve some. You can solve diabetes. You can cure high blood pressure. You can cure cholesterol. You can clear, uh, cure sleep apnea. And bariatric surgery is actually fairly effective. All right. So this is remember um, the percentage total weight loss over a 10-year period with lifestyles and medications. This is your gastric band, so that restrictive thing that's less uh, post-op uh, does has less problems. This is for gastric bypass. The ruin why. All right, so it's very effective. You lose a ton of weight at the beginning, and you will tend to keep it off in time. This is the average of all the people who've, ta who've done this surgery over a 10-year period of a study. Right, so obviously, there's lots of variation. But generally speaking, bariatric surgeries tend to be more effective than just lifestyle, lifestyle changes or drugs. Also has uh, impacts on diabetes. And we'll skip this just for time's sake. But generally, if you look at these slides, you uh, compare just medical therapies versus surgicals. Therapies, you have better body max index, better glycemic hemoglobin. Um, this is the before of uh, kind of a poll of people, how people feel in various aspects of their lives, pre and post these treatments. And you can see that here with the gastric bypass, everyone feels better, generally speaking, about their lives. Right, so, gastric, gastric surgery is something that's commonly used. Well, it's getting more increasingly commonly used, it is not without its risks but it seems to be very effective. Definitely more so than just lifestyle changes or drugs. But again, you don't advise doing it unless everything else has failed. Because again, it has the most risk.